everybody, and welcome to Speed's coverage of the Speed World Challenge. It's the New Jersey Grand Prix presented by Volvo, round three of the Speed World Challenge GT Championship. I'm Greg Creamer, joined by Tom Natchew. In fact, covering two races today, as we'll be staying on the East Coast later, going to Mosport for touring cars. But today, Thunderbolt Raceway at New Jersey Motorsports Park. And now it's time for the new coin toss. Let's get down to Tom Natchew. All right, here we are for round number three at New Jersey Motorsports Park. Andy Pilgrim, you have the pull. I'm going to flip this coin in the air. Please call it in the air. If you win, the grid stays the same. If you lose, the grid inverts. Are you ready? Call it in the air. Tails. Tails it is. Yeah. <laughs> Andy, just come on over for a second. Andy, uh, it's a 50-50 deal, and as uh, Peter Cunningham said, Tails never fails. Yeah, he was right. He was right. I actually wasn't really thinking what to call. I, I went with Petey. I totally thought, okay, Petey's got to be right. Well, it, it turns out now you do have the pull, and it is the first pull for these brand new Volvos. Well, yeah, well, Randy, 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 Randy got, did have the pull. Yeah, yeah. I, I just have to say, I just ran probably one of the best laps I've ever run in qualifying. I have to thank the uh, the Volvo and 3R Racing and uh, KPAX, of course. Uh, very happy to be here. It was one of those laps. It wasn't working right in the practice session right before, and it was just perfect. They did an amazing job. Great. We're thinking about uh, weather tomorrow. Everybody's been watching it. You've got to be thinking rain. Well, if it rains, obviously we've got a, we've got a major advantage in the rain. We really don't want to win in the rain. We want to win in the dry. So I, I hope it stays dry personally. Andy Pilgrim keeps his pull here at New Jersey. Well, that has certainly rattled things a couple of times, but it stays pat this time. And Tom Natchew, let's take a look, a high-speed look, a sped-up look at this great track. Well, there is some high-speed sections here. We just got through one of them and just coming on to another one. But for the most part, New Jersey Motorsports Park, you're always turning. And if you're not always turning, you're always getting set up for the next turn. It is a fascinating course, Greg. And when we watch these guys operating out here, the qualifying, it's, it's all within about a second of each other. But there's a new dynamic happening today. You can see it on the K-Pax Racing windshield. It's starting to rain. The forecast is for maybe it's going to rain, maybe it's not going to rain. Either way, it's going to play an important dynamic on this racetrack, second year out. And we're still all always turning at New Jersey Motorsports Park. Cool and damp last year in the debut, likely going to be damp today. You can see the two Volvos put together a great qualifying effort, a good look there at the 53 Mike Hartley driven Designs Constructions Dodds Viper. He's out of Williamstown, New Jersey, a local favorite. And Joey Scarallo, the Group A Pontiac GTO. But at the front, it is all Volvo. And with that uh, front row not being inverted with the coin toss, they maintain that position. Then you've got Brandon Davis, pole sitter here last year. James Safronis, winner here last year with his first ever World Challenge victory. Then Rivera Curran filling out the rest of the top three rows. And when we come back to New Jersey, this field will set sail. Welcome back to New Jersey, everybody. Standing start, one of the highlights of World Challenge, especially in GT. And we are ready to go. When those red lights go out, we go green. Lots of smoke from those turbo Volvos. The lights are out. And away we go, and Randy Popes, boy, he uh, jumped just a little bit, let off, and that's going to let Brandon Davis in that green and black Mustang take a look down the inside, can't get it done, and the silver Corvette of Gables trying the outside of James Safronis as we go on board with Sonny Whelan, Tom. Sonny Whelan gets a good look from about the midpoint of the grid, and you can see all of that bedlam in front of him. Sonny decides, let's just let that go and see if these wet conditions begin to play in. Meanwhile, it's still Volvo 1-2. Ooh, hardly a big slide in the back. And if it does get damp, that should play into the hands of these all-wheel drive Volvos. Gunter Saldock takes a look down the inside of Gaples. He is denied. Gaples slamming the door shut. And, uh, well, it was a lurid slide. It turned into more than that for New Jersey native Hartley. And that's going to put him a little bit further back in the pack as we watch the field come through. And uh, one of the stories is, of course, Randy Popes and that jump. If it was deemed a jump, Tom, that's going to be a tough uh, run down to the pit lane. Well, it's always difficult to know what to do. If you jump, do you just keep going? Tony Gaples did that one year. He just kept going and shortened that inevitable black flag lap. But Randy Popes by now knows he'll have been on the radio to the team. He was on the radio to uh, SCCA Pro Racing. They'll know if they're coming in or not. It's Randy's choice now. He can drive under the flag to take that black flag and make up another lap before he reports and see what he does. Well, it looked like he continued to stay out. Yes, he did. So he's trying to give himself a little bit of room. And those two Volvos getting away in a hurry. And interestingly, after qualifying, Andy Pilgrim said they just threw a setup on the car before qualifying to loosen it up. He said it was wicked quick for a lap or two. 
and then it went away, so he's trying to make some hay while the, well, the sun's not shining, but you know the adage. Meanwhile, Kern moving up a spot after starting dead last. Yeah, Kern uh, started this thing last. Now he's got his teammate to deal with. This is one of those opportunities where teammates can be a beneficiary to you. Speaking of teammates, here's Bill Ziegler, the 05 car, that Swisher racing car, not having a good start to the weekend. Kern, as he makes up a spot getting by his teammate, he goes by Sonny Whelan, those two Whelan engineering vets. The report for Curran started from pit lane, a dead battery. They changed it, and that allowed the car to fire. He's on the same lap. These are all for position, Tom, but it's going to be a long day for Eric. Eric Curran's got to make his way up there, but you can see the kind of respect he's showing for his teammate. His teammates are going to get a mirror full of Joey Scarello at the back. That New Jersey, or at least New York State GTO, one of the baddest in the system, and Joey Scarello will race wheel to wheel. Speaking of wheel to wheel, Greg... These are the two winners of our opening two races. The orange Taxmasters Porsche, Tony Rivera, won at Sebring. James Sofronis, that blue and white Global Motorsports Group Porsche, won at Long Beach in the most recent race. And nice move by Rivera as he was able to slide by, demoting Sofronis down. And here comes Popes for his penalty. Okay, this is going to be a long drive down pit lane. The speed limit very low for the safety. You can see it's relatively narrow there. And uh, this weekend, there's a lot of cars on pit lane, so it's going to be a long drive. Why Andy Pilgrim adds to his lead. There is the entire field passing Randy Popes. And if you think it's slow from outside, try it from inside the car, Greg. And a stop at the end of it as well. And Randy, you could just feel the tension inside that car as he now just gasses it to get going again. There is Eric Kern, and he continues to move up through the pack. He just laid a nice pass on Gunter Schaldock and the Lala Motorsports Viper. After that big crash in practice at Long Beach, they spent the interim rebuilding that car and building a second backup car so that wouldn't happen again. And they, they've done that to great success, but now Kern sets off after that beautiful Kleinschmitting Black Dog Racing Corvette of Gables. Gives you an idea how important track position is here as you're starting to see a lot of respect between uh, Tony Gables and Eric Curran. Eric Curran doesn't assume that he belongs by him. He's been a, a longtime competitor with this man, Tony Gables. To win in World Challenge, it, it takes the... Uh, well, the way I look at it is it takes... Uh, the, the car is about 40% of the equation. you got to have a good car. you got to have a good team. you got to have good crew guys. That's about another 40%. Uh, and you, and you gotta uh, have a good, you know, good, decent drive. And uh, we've always liked the rain here at Black Dog. Uh, I've grown up in the, in the snow belt in the Chicagoland area, and so whenever it rains, that, that just plays into our advantage. It, it takes the, uh, well, it takes the horsepower uh, advantage away from some teams, but it, it generally works to our favor. Uh, I'm good in the wet, and then. Uh, a, a, with a decent drive, uh, you know, a little luck never hurt anybody. Well, luck certainly always does play a key role, but as they say, luck is often where preparation meets opportunity. You make your own luck, and that's what a top flight team does. And, oh, Curran driving for such a team, and one of those top drivers, beautiful move down underneath Gables and picks up another spot. I'll tell you, Tom, when that Wheeling Engineering car is working, that is a great program, and Kern, man, can that kid drive? Yeah, I'll tell you something else. Tony Gables knows he can drive. I think he opened the door a little bit there. He picked a spot on the track where he knew he wasn't going to get hurt by this, and uh, he let uh, Eric go through. As you can see, not only is there respect between these two guys, but they qualify very close. They race, race each other with respect, and that's an amazing thing in World Challenge. He's starting to get these bonds all built up. Intense competition in the early going here of round three of the Speed World Challenge GT Championship. And as you can see, Eric Kern, currently the man on the march. We'll be back. And welcome back. Speed GT action unfolding here at New Jersey Motor Sports Park. Up front, it remains Andy Pilgrim as we watch Gunter Schaldock now coming back on Tony Gables, remounting the charge that he had just a little bit earlier. Gables was able to gap him a little bit, but Gunter is coming right back after him. Speaking of after him, Eric Kern, as we talked about, Tom, has reeled in last year's winner here, James Sofronis. Two race winners, two guys who do respect each other in two completely different rides. As we can see, Porsche against Corvette, two completely different platforms. How are they going to deal with this impending rain? Almost as different and vastly different between the setup between a Corvette and that Viper. This is going to be interesting if it gets wet. Very interesting mix, of course, six-cylinder Porsche, eight-cylinder VET, 10-cylinder Viper, 
four-cylinder turbo Volvos. I mean, does it have four? I thought it might have three or something. Well, it's got, by the look of the smoke coming into that thing, the turbochargers in there are about the size of washing machines. I, I think so. Yeah. There's new sleek washing <laughs> machines you can get. But again, Curran really hammering right now, trying to figure out a way by Sofronis. In the wet, the Porsche is generally considered to be pretty good. All the engine weight right over those drive wheels, so you get the car straightened out, you can get good launch out of the turns. But these Volvos with all-wheel drive, that's going to be magic if this track gets really damp. The practice session here was very wet, and the two Volvos run a class unto themselves pretty much. So everybody's going to be a little bit fearful other than the two drivers in those Volvos should that happen. But Kern right now again gets within half a car length of Sophronis in this battle, trying to work his way up to the front. Nothing between them, Tom. Yeah, these guys are going out in hammer and tongue, but they know it's a long race. 30 laps are not even halfway through yet. These guys are going to the front, and there's still the impending rain. Everybody's been talking about it. The radio chatter is always about the weather. In typical weatherman, we see the rain right over top of us on our uh, internet-based weather, and it's not raining. So it's going to happen sooner or later. Ooh, battle for fourth. Boy, it is intense. Curran now squares up a little bit, uses the big horsepower now, cuts to the inside. Sophronis defends, and Curran has to fall back just a little bit. But this is some great racing. Joey Scarolo, a call in the pits in the Group A wheels entry. And Curran finally gets the nose of the vet down underneath the Global Motorsports Group Porsche. Question is, can he make it work? He does. Sophronis realized he'd been had and gives the spot up. And again, clean. James Sofronis wasn't about to get into it in that long parabolic bend there. You just don't know how it's going to work up, especially when traction is waning, not a building up. So James Sofronis makes a very wise move there and lives to fight another day. There's a long way to go yet, Greg. There is, and a big margin between Pilgrim and your second place runner, which is that Sun Microsystems ACS black and green Mustang of Brandon Davis, pole sitter here last year. Then behind him now comes the 97 Taxmasters Porsche, of Tony Rivera. We go back just a little bit to this superb battle and it continues to unfold for the sixth spot between Gaples and Shaldock. And uh, Shaldock, pretty relentless right now. Yeah, but every once in a while he looks in his rearview mirror and he sees that blue and yellow Volvo and thinks, oh brother, I've got enough in front of me to deal with. Why do I have to deal with this thing behind me? He knows he's coming and there's the view from Randy Post and oh. we see, I think that's the 34 car going off in front of Randy Pope's, losing a bit of momentum and now he has an opportunity to make up a spot, but on the 34 and not on the number nine, Gunter Sheldak Viper. Well, Sheldak's relentless pressure paid off and apparently Gaples felt it, just made that little bobble. And now Pope slides through as well. And that may be a function of when you've been running as hard as Gaples was and you get off track, your tires get dirtied up, takes a few corners to get them clean, you don't have quite the grip. And Pope's not gonna wait around in that K-Pax Volvo and jumps on it. But talking about Gunter, this was his best ever qualifying performance, seventh. And after qualifying, he wasn't happy. He said there was more in the car and I was just starting to really get to it. And then, he said the checkered flag came out. He goes, I got something to prove in this race, and boy is he. He is putting together a strong run. That's like the World Challenge Formula. It's 20-minute practice sessions. You get two of those. You get a 20-minute qualifying session, and these races are over in five zero minutes, something we barely talk about. You know, these guys do not get a lot of time for preparation. And Andy Pilgrim continues his great run at the front. Brandon Davis sits in second, but running in third right now is the gent who won in his first World Challenge race at Sebring. We ask him to tell us about that. To win, uh, I, I can't even explain what it was like, especially in my first race. Um, a lot of disbelief. Um, it was just, uh, I don't know. I, I found myself marching up towards the front, and then there were no longer any cars in front of me. Really caught me off guard to see the white flag because I was so focused. I did not. Even, I had no idea how much longer the race was. Uh, so that that last lap was just, you know, on pins and needles. I think I went slower than anybody else on the track just not to mess up the last lap. And seeing the checkered flag was just. I, it was a pretty amazing experience. You know, one of those that you only have once. You, you can only have your first win one time. I just want to win again. Well, he is, after all, a true racer, and as his good friend in SCCA Pro Racing PR maven, Eric Prill said, an overnight story, 20 years in the making. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's been wanting to be in World Challenge for a long time. For, for the longest time, Greg, he had his sights set on touring car, didn't he? he? Peter Cunningham was one of his heroes, literally, and that's where he wanted to go, and he said, I really had no interest in, in GT, he said, till I drove him. He said, high horsepower, not a lot of aero grip. He goes, that's racing. 
What's not to like here? Yeah. Yes, you've got four-wheel drive, four-cylinder cars running on a par with Dodge Vipers. World Challenge has found a great formula. And these GT cars so evenly matched in qualifying, out here competing in their own battles, this is why they call this the best tin top racing on the planet right now with all these different makes and models. And that's only half the story, Greg. You gotta make them all run together. And somehow, they found the magic formula. Well, the World Challenge and the SCCA Pro Racing tech staff have done a phenomenal job with this balancing act. But yet each of the cars have their own strengths and weaknesses. And obviously, with this impending weather we're looking at, that all-wheel drive of the Volvo is going to play. And as Randy Popes looks down the inside of Gunter Schaldock, trying to work his way back up to the pack. This is for position. Gunter, a little bobble there, ran wide, and Popes continues his march to the front, one position away from the top five, but it's still teammate Andy Pilgrim out front. We are back to New Jersey Motorsports Park, third round of the World Challenge GT Championship, and guess what? The weather has hit. Windshield wipers on, cars skating everywhere. Brandon Davis. How's he doing that? Wow. How's he driving a Mustang with about a million horsepower in the rain like that? Unbelievable talent, Brandon Davis. Maybe nobody told him you couldn't do that. So Car just, control. Car control. It's a gift. Beyond that keeps on giving. Now. Yeah. And he's doing a great job. And remember, had the pole here last year, ended up getting jumped at the start. And James Safronis, the Global Motorsports Group Porsche, makes a call down pit lane. You know what I think he's and doing? I haven't seen any problems with the car, Tom. Is this strategy? I think he's gambling. I think he's coming in for reins, hoping that he can do it within one lap, get out on the lead lap of all these guys stay on dry. That's going to give the, give the Global Motorsport guys an advantage. James Safronis trying to make something happen. Just been passed into the top five by uh, the number 30 car. So now he's taking the race into his own hands. This is unconventional. This is unconventional, and remember, it is World Challenge, which is not known for high-speed pit stops because they're sprint races. So I think you made the key point. Can he get it done and stay on the lead lap? Oh, no, no, we're not talking about 14 seconds here. Yeah, exactly. It takes 14 seconds to make the decision to come in. But uh, no, we're talking about 30, 40 seconds. But it is a slow lap. I mean, this is our first lap under rain. Can Safranas get it out on those brand new uh, rain Toyos? And if he does, he's going to have an advantage. This is the car he's got to come out in front of. And Andy Pilgrim uh, from the radio reports has indicated he was actually pretty happy to see the rain because with the Davis, the pressure that Davis was keeping on him, he wasn't all over him, but he was always there. He said he was rooting the fronts up a little bit. This is going to take some of that pressure off. These cars so much better in the wet, and that may very well help. And, of course, the guy it should help immensely is his teammate, Randy Pope. Yeah, it's going to help him to close things up. There's James Safronis. Is he going to be able to get out in time? Oh, it's that close. That's close. <laughs> so with rain tires, he'll be able to stay ahead. But wait a minute now. Greg, that was a pace car coming in a pit lane. Yes, a full course yellow has been called. Again, the rain has picked up seriously. And it's uh, considered a little bit of a safety concern. All these drivers out on basically hot, slick tires, if you will. They're a Groove Toyo tire, but uh, they are very warm and they are not cut for rain. So at this point, a full course caution has been called. And boy, Randy Popes made it to fifth before this caution. That is going to bunch this field up. He should be booking when we come back to New Jersey. We are back. It's going to be a single file restart. This year, SCCA has implemented a double file restart, but in wet conditions due to the safety factor in single file. There's the acceleration cone. The green flag flies, and Andy Pilgrim in that Volvo leads them away. And now we're going to look at Randy Popes. He was fifth. At the drop of the green, he's around the outside of Rivera. He is second or third, and he's looking at second. Davis, not going to give it to him that easy. But right now, look at Randy Post all over the back of Brandon Davis. Tom, I don't think that second for Davis is going to be secure for long. Well, he didn't come in for rain tires. He's still up there in this relatively wet track on dry tires. For my money, the guy's doing an unbelievable job to keep in front of the Volvo this long. But then there's Rivera in the Porsche. Seems to be going along fine. And there is your pass for second place. That is uh, Randy Popes, the number one car, going under Brandon Davis. As I said, amazing you could hang on this long, Greg. Well, it is. Again, on those dry tires, as are the Volvos, but the all-wheel drive really negates that. There's only one car out there that's on reins, and it is James Sofronis. And you see him there right behind Eric Kern, that little twitch as he goes down underneath Gunter Schaldock. And there is Sofronis. So they gambled. They made the stop for reins. If it stays wet, that should help him out immensely. If it starts to dry, 
that could be a real problem. Right now, Safronis making it work for him at this stage. And up front, look at that. Once Post was able to get around Brandon Davis, you don't even see him in the picture. There's Curran as he continues to move up with Shaldock, who is really on form here, Tom. He's looking at perhaps a career best finish. Gunter and that Lala Motorsports team after the disappointment of Long Beach, they're erasing that today. Well, given the fact that it's going to be rainy for a while, we're just going to say advantage Volvos. Fascinating battle developing back here. We've got this number 14 car for now. The rain tires seem to be working. So I'm going to flip flop one more time. Maybe the strategy is working for James Safranis. I just was worried about that yellow, but you know, Greg, nobody else came in. So if rain tire territory is what it is, James has got a bit of an advantage here. Yeah, I, th I think actually the yellow may have helped him because nobody else came in under it. It allowed him to make that stop. He didn't lose the lap, was able to get right back onto the tail end of the lead pack by the time they went green. So he didn't have to make up any of that distance. And uh, the only problem for him now is he's up against guys. Yeah, they are on dry tires right now, but they're pretty talented. Tony Rivera here in this Taxmasters Porsche, the orange Porsche. Eric Kern in the Wheel and Engineering Corvette. Both awfully good shoes and uh, having himself a great run. Watch the lines there. We saw Davis skating around just a little bit. He's got a handle now on that ACS Sun Microsystems Mustang. And again, Safronis. Oh, big wiggle there by Rivera. And that's enough. Curran is through. And, oh, he's really lost it. There's more going on there. Something went wrong inside the cockpit. It looked, and I don't even know if this is possible, but look, he might have shut the thing off for just a little bit. And now he's getting back underway. That is a very costly minor error for Tony Rivera. How do you explain that one over the radio to the crew back in the pits, Greg? Well, you know, every once in a while, you have a moment like that. You're flailing on the wheel to save it. You hit switches and buttons sometimes. Ron Fellows used to say, elbows and knees flying all over the cockpit. And that was the kind of moment Tony Rivera just had. The weather is becoming a factor in this race. As is Curran. <laughs> Look at these two Holy guys. Cow. Boy, once Eric Curran gets around somebody and he's got clear track in front of him, he is flying. And after that little mistake, whatever happened, it was certainly there was a moment, and then if he hit a switch or whatever, Rivera trying to come right back. He and Safronis. I think there's a little orange paint now on that uh, Global Motorsports Group right rear quarter panel as they come up and through these twisty bits here. And, boy, Tony Rivera, after that problem, Tom, has gathered it up and looks quick. Rex is basically flat out now. Fourth gear, fifth gear over the top of the hill. They're not going to quite touch top gear as they go into the corner. Very high speed, taking some braking in there. And Rivera sees an advantage. He's alongside, and he is through, but just barely. That's the difference between these Toyo rain tires and dries. Rivera's got the dries working just that much better at this part of the race. Well, and that's the bad news for Safronis. The rain has lightened up, and that is going to really hurt him with those deep groove rain Toyos that are a much softer compound. They heat way too easily. They can chunk and break apart, and the uh, people that stayed on the dries are going to be in much better shape. And, of course, the two Volvos with that all-wheel drive in the damp were able to open that margin up and they've got a little room to play with. But the compelling battle, this one for the final podium spot, Brandon Davis and Eric Kern. Davis starts the season with two consecutive third-place finishes. Kern with two consecutive second-place finishes. That puts them well up in the points hunt in this third round of the championship. This, in many ways, is a battle for the points lead. You know, we've talked about this before, but these guys were teammates on the real-time team in Touring Car, and they had a finish at Denver that nobody's going to forget anytime soon where they were over the start-finish line, door handle to door handle, literally leaning on each other. And that wasn't so many years ago. Now they're no longer teammates, but these guys have respect between them as well. Brandon Davis and Eric Curran, you know what? I'm betting there's smiles in behind those visors in both of these cars. I would agree, and that's one of the things you talk about, the respect. World Challenge Racing, incredibly clean. The drivers are all top caliber drivers, and they've been racing each other in many cases for a while. And when a rookie does come into the championship, like a Tony Rivera, he is top caliber as well. And uh, it allows you to have a lot of confidence in the guy you're racing with. And right now, those two Volvos continue to ease away. Pilgrim in front of Popes, the 8 and the 1, the K-Pax cars. Here we go. The battle for the podium spot. Curran came in, as I mentioned, leading in the points. Davis right in that top points group as well. This is a huge battle right now. The two Volvos slide through, and there, just in the back of the frame, you can see that battle coming up as Pilgrim putting another lap in the books. And as a matter of fact, we start the final lap. One to go. Boy, and Davis in a straight line, that Mustang definitely hauls the mail, doesn't it? 
You know, it does it does have its advantages over uh, Eric Curran, but you know that it's not all done between these guys. Eric is definitely going to make a run, and just for good measure, Brandon throws the headlights on. I don't know who that's meant to impress. Certainly not Curran. Curran's going to be trying to get in his way through. And these guys, well, there's a whole lot of executives from Volvo here this uh, weekend. The two Volvo guys, they're just trying to put in a photo finish. Well, I think maybe those headlights are to try and uh, persuade Curran's teammate, Sonny Whelan, to let them through unabated. Sonny, a true pro and a class act, he's not going to get involved in that fight and moves over and lets him go through. And Randy Popes, boy, he is closing up. Now, that may be more a function of Pilgrim backing off, believing that his teammate's not going to come after him and do anything too silly. Not so, as you pointed out, Tom, for this battle for third. Curran continues to run within a car length in spots, closes up and others, loses a little bit. They are down to just a matter of feet as they wind through this long, never-ending right-hander. Curran looks to the outside. Is he there? No. Davis covers. Could he hit him? Oh, yes, he could. Inside. But nobody hits anybody. You're right. It's incredibly clean and incredibly competitive racing between Brandon Davis and Eric Curran, Mustang versus Corvette. This is true vintage world challenge. And there go the Volvos, Greg. And they do under the checkered flags for a 1-2 sweep. The battle for the third podium spot will go to Brandon Davis. But up front, the story is Volvo. And at the very top, it's Andy Pilgrim. KPAX 3R Racing is a new team for me. It's a privilege to be running with these guys. I've run with a lot of factory teams, and uh, these guys are equal to any factory team I've been with, and I want to say thank you to them, and thank you to Jim Huey for uh, giving me the opportunity. Thanks to Randy Polst. We've raced each other for about 47 years now, I think, since we were babies, and uh, he's one of the toughest guys to run against, and uh, I just want to say thanks for being a good teammate, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the rest of the year, and... All the Volvo people here from corporate. Well, what can I say? It's awesome. So nice to win here. Thanks again. On behalf of Paul Reed Smith and PRS Guitars, we'd like to present you with this uh, very fine example of their craft. They're just down the road here. These things are manufactured locally. Some say the best guitars in the world for one of the best drivers in the world driving one of the best cars in the world. Boy, that is one sweet axe, and he earned it. What a great drive. That uh, Volvo team going 1-2. Brandon Davis on the podium as well. Let's take a look at our unofficial results. Pilgrim and Popes, the sweep for Volvo. Davis, Kern, Schaldock, career best finish for Gunter. Absolutely great effort. Let's take a look now at the points. After three of ten rounds in World Challenge GT, Kern up over Davis, and then Porsche up by five over Ford. When we come back, we go to Mosport. <sighs> Touring cars on that track, it's going to be great. Welcome back, and we now go to a very damp Mosport International Raceway, one of the most daunting tracks in the world, let alone in the wet. It is the Toyo Tires Victoria Day Speed Fest at Mosport, presented by Optima Batteries. Third round of the World Challenge Touring Car Championship. Time for the coin toss. Eric Foss, you've won the poll for Speed World Challenge round number three. This is the official coin. I want you to flip it, okay. call it in the air, and when it lands on the ground, if you win the toss, You'll stay in the pool. If you don't, your partner goes to pool. Right. Call it. Tails it is. Eric Foss stays in the pool here at Mosport International Raceway. And that is huge. First time pull for the rookie. Let's take a high-speed lap around Mosport. Time. Well, high-speed turn coming up first here. Turn two. Everybody talks about it at uh, Mosport. It's the most famous turn. One of the most famous turns in North America. Possibly the world. Extremely high speed. You get it woe down. Third gear in a touring car around here through turn number three. And this year, absolutely flat out over the crest of this hill into another famous corner at Mosport, Moss Corner. Named after Sterling Moss, not after Mosport, which is named after Motorsport. This is what Frank Orr used to call the Mary Andretti more or less straightaway. But it's not just that there's bends in it. There's also 10 stories of elevation change here. You're drag racing up a hill and then into the very fast turn number eight. There's untold amount of things to hit and places to slide off into a tightening number nine. And then White's Corner, turn number 10, onto the front straightaway. That is one lap of most points. And interestingly, on that lap, you saw the rain line. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Our starting lineup for the rookie, his first season of World Challenge, he's on pole. And I think let's talk a little bit about that. Eric Foss, it was his teammate's third race last year as a rookie when he got pole in a win 
at Miller Motorsports Park. The pressure is on and Foss living up to it right now as we take a look at the rest of the grid. And Nick Whitmer, his first World Challenge run, joining that real-time team. That's going to be a story. He's got. He's already done a race today, and he's going to bring that knowledge ready for the start, Craig. And when the lights go out, we go racing. Touring cars launch, except Foss. Nothing. He's just sitting there. And a great launch by the 36 of James Clay. And he gets right up alongside Whitmer as they head down into turn one. But Eric Foss, nothing happening. We're on board with Jason Saney. Tom, that was close. You know, Jason Saney picks that outside line to get around Foss and carries the acceleration through and puts himself in a great position. But look at that number 36 car. Incredible launch by James Clay. And oh, no, it all goes away right there, having trouble putting the power down in that bowl at the bottom of one where you've got to accelerate over the top of turn two. This is a lot wetter than we thought it is. You can see Jason Saney working the wheel in there. They are tiptoeing around Mosport for lap number one, Greg. A couple of great decisions by Saney. One, to get around teammate Foss, and then two, to go to the outside and get around Clay and put him up in the second. You can tell Jason Saney from rookie last year to absolute star this year. But Kuno Whitmer, this is one of the guys this entire field is looking at. Meanwhile, we're going to watch from onboard Foss's car. This and he's is a struggling. replay. Yeah, you can see one, two, three, four times he tries to start the car. Then he gets away. The last car, that is Nick Whitmer, manages to get by. Now, what you can see, there are two BMWs, the number 38 and the number 34 cars, respectively Seth Thomas and Nick is saying they both have elected to start from pit lane. So on the back straight, it shapes up like this. They're picking up some speed, and you can see the amount of elevation change, but still very, very tiptoey around here. And Kuno Whitmer, using his local knowledge and the fact that he's already raced today in the Canadian Touring Car Championship, brings that to the track. You talked about the rain line. Well, the rain line at Mosport, Greg, is where the rubber ain't. Stay off the line, and you're going to be going faster. Yeah, and that race that Whitmer, the Whitmer brothers ran earlier today was in the damp. So they, not only local track knowledge, as you point out, but where the grip is now, Saney finding where it's not. Boy, brilliant save. Almost got off into the grass, and had he gone much further off, that would have been huge. But that cost him a spot, and uh, that is, I think, Kleinubing was able to just knife around him. Indeed, Kleindubing being the opportunist in that uh, moment. And now he has an opportunity to set out after this man, Kuno Whitmer. Then you'll see Kleindubing come through here in just a moment. There's the gap for first, second, third. And just to keep things interesting, you've got another real-time car and another tri-point car in back. That is Charles Espinlov we're watching. And behind him, a recovering Eric Foss. And Espinlov, though, goes straight off at the outside of eight. And Eric Foss, maybe target fixation, loops it as well. And close. We'll be back. Welcome back to Mosport, everybody. Round three of the World Challenge Touring Car Championship underway, lap 11. And you're watching a great battle unfolding. The real-time racing 2009 spec Acura of Pierre Kleinubing in front of the Tri-Point Mazda of Jason Saney. And behind him, the 08 spec real-time Acura of World Challenge first-timer Nick Whitmer. But Nick knows this track, he knows the conditions, and he is flying. And he is up into this battle right now, and that puts him up into the fourth spot. And he is dicing it up against some awfully talented competitors. The guy that runs second right now, leading this trio, Klein Ubing. And you can see it is slick. Oh, insane. He's going to get a run on him. Is it enough? Let's watch. No, he's not able to make it stick. What I was going to say about Klein Ubing, four wins here over his career at Mosport, so he certainly has track knowledge, but he also has company line astern in Jason Saney. We talk about the respect of this track. Saney tells us why. Uh, there's lots of places to make a mistake here. Uh, you know, Mosport's got a lot of really high speed corners and there are a lot of walls that are fairly close, so uh, it's not a place you want to make a mistake. Uh, probably the biggest mistake to make that you, that you will make here is in, in turn 5B, not getting on the back straightaway um, with enough momentum. You know, such a long straightaway and an uphill straightaway that you need to get a good run out of there. So uh, that's when the racing will get interesting. If somebody bobbles there, there'll be uh, another car all over them coming into turn eight. So awesome place to race here. I love it. One of my favorite tracks. Well, nothing like calling your own pass, is it? That is exactly what he did coming out of Moss and got that great run and sweeps right around the outside of Kleinubing. And that's a nice job right there because, Tom, the rain line around eight is actually that outside. It's spooky, but that's where there's a bit more grip. And with Pierre pinned to the inside, 
Jason was able to execute that beautifully. He did a really great job, and Pierre Klein loves it here in the rain. As you mentioned, he's got four wins here already, but in the rain, you know, just coming up here to the driver's right, there's a uh, the top of turn number two. There's at least 150 guys who come here strictly to watch that move go down around <laughs> turn number two. And it was beautifully executed by Nick Whitmer, brother of race leader Kuno Whitmer. And Nick, this may be his debut race in World Challenge, but he's driven similar equipment and has lots of laps around here at Mosport. And is he putting that to good use? What a great story. You know, there's grip and momentum. He had so much momentum carrying over from uh, turn number one. He knew exactly where to put the car in turn number two, never having touched the accelerator. Saying he's slowing down as uh, Whitmer just blew on by him, purely on momentum. So down into Moss, where Jason got that great run last lap. He now has a different looking Acura right Look behind him. Nick Whitmer, and Whitmer way around the outside. It did that work. What a move by Whitmer. Boy, the lad knows where the sticky stuff is. You know, that would be insane in the dry. But in the wet, Nick Whitmer makes it work for him. And P2, 3, and 4 have changed places all within a couple of laps, Greg. Well, this is an incredible back and forth swap battle right now. And I'll tell you what, I think Jason Saney, and I'm betting Pierre Kleinhubing, being the savvy vet he is, watched that move by Whitmer and went, oh, maybe we can use that a little bit later in the race. And as the race unfolds, one of the things we're watching is the performance differential between the 08 cars and the new 09 spec cars. We asked Pierre Kleinhubing to tell us a little bit about those. At Sebring, I had the old car. So uh, I had a, you know, I, I knew what I had, a strong package. I got to Jersey, and um, the new car wasn't, wasn't quite as good yet. So, uh, you know, by the time I figured out what I needed to be, to be done for that track, it was, it was a bit too late. It was after qualifying. I did go, the, you know, had the fastest lap in the race show some promise, but uh, I kept making too many rookie mistakes felt like it. Um, every time I got close to front or close to make a pass, uh, I drove off the road for some stupid reason. That I, you know, it's errors, my mistakes, but um, um, we're good. I think we'll be good here. Like, uh, if, especially if it rains, I think we have a really strong car. Well, he's certainly showing that in these damp conditions and refreshing honesty from the 13-year World Challenge and real-time racing veteran. And Tom, I've watched this guy race for so many years, so many races here at Mosport. I remember battle with Taz Harvey when his car got badly deranged and he suddenly was right back in the fray for a podium. I think truly one of the most gifted drivers I've ever seen. You know, no doubt about it. And it, it takes a, a track like Mosport to separate the men from the boys. When it, the going gets tough, you know, we see this driver get going time and time again. Remember the first time the touring cars went to VIR and uh, this man, Pierre Kleinebing, took uh, part in that single car qualifying wadded up that Acura so badly it took the team all night to get it going. He won the race with it the next day without one uh, straight panel. He's a remarkable, remarkable talent. And that not one straight panel, I mean the car was still not quite right and he just picked it up by the scruff of the neck and his car control carried him to that win. Now he's got his work cut out for him though as he's got a first get around Jason Saney and then a very fast Nick Whitmer who really is making an impression in his first World Challenge appearance. These Whitmer brothers have it strong and uh, he is putting on a great show right now so really Tom it makes it a Whitmer 1-2 right now doesn't it? And here's another battle between two cars. These cars identical. The 73 car of Charles Espenlob and the 75 car of Eric Foss who's managed to find each other on the racetrack again and they go side by side through nine still finding their way through the wet Craig. Espenlob a little bobble at turn eight. Foss jumping on it is now up into sixth. We're heading to the end of this one. Great racing. Don't go anywhere. We are back in Mosport third round of the World Challenge Touring Car Championship unfolding. Kuno Whitmer has him covered right now. This is the battle. His brother, Nick Whitmer, also a real-time accurate driver. Then Jason Saney in the Tri-Point Mazda Speed Mazda behind him. One of the winningest drivers in the history of World Challenge competition, the 42 real-time racing Acura of Pierre Kleinhubi. Second, third, fourth. There they are. And this has been a great battle, and it is getting closer still. Saney all over the back of Whitmer, and joining them is Kleinhubi. That's the margin, the proverbial blanket time.
You know, we see one of the uh, Bimber World Gear Wrench cars out there. It's a rear wheel drive, front wheel drive situation in this sopping wet. The rear wheel drive cars absolutely have nothing for the front wheel drive cars. We're getting reports back on the radio that Seth Thomas says he can't really put his foot to the floor on the back straight until he selects fourth gear. So they're getting a lot of wheel spin. They're out there trying to gather these ver valuable points, but they're really not in this contest. This is a battle for front wheel drives here in the wet at most points. A bit frustrating for Seth, certainly, after the win at Sebring and then uh, had that great qualifying effort for round two of the championship at uh, New Jersey. Snapped a half shaft on the start. Who knows what would have happened, and now just struggling with handling in the wet. But that's the things that build character, and the Bimmer World team is going to be a player, to be sure. The conditions just not favoring them right now, as they are the real-time boys, certainly up front. Just a tremendous run for Whitmer. As he closes up on the back of Seth Thomas in one of those Bimmer World Gear Wrench BMWs, hop on board, Tom, and uh, he's just going to sweep the outside. Boy, those actors are just hooked up. And Kuno Whitmer knew that he's a wounded bird out there. He made it easy in nine. He knows that's the leader behind them. And, you know, you hear this young man, Kuno Whitmer, talking about it's great to be here. He's racing in the World Challenge, and this has been a dream of his. And he says, with the greatest of respect, that all these drivers are great. Well, they all are great. Seth Thomas is one of the greatest. He's going to make it easy for these guys to get through. He's not a part of this action, but he is going to try to stay on this thing and get whatever points he can. And speaking of getting points, you can see Kleinubing has gone around Saney and is all over the back of young Nick Whitmer. There we go down into turn one and Saney has dropped off a bit. You wonder if there wasn't some sort of a little bobble perhaps that Saney had. So now that battle for second becomes one for the two real-time cars of Nick Whitmer and Pierre Kleinubing in very close concert as they come by. And there is Kuno Whitmer now catching up Toby Grohovic, another real-time driver, an exact same spec car he's driving. That's the 08 spec car. They have radio contact. Nathan, the crew chief, will have let Toby know that uh, the leader is coming by. But uh, just to make certain, we call this the old world challenge, here I come move. He's flashing the headlights like he was on the 417 headed to the Laurentians. That's up by Mont Tremblant, huh? Well, let's go back to this battle for second, and Kleinubing now relentless in his attack on Kuno's younger brother, Nick, in this battle for second spot, and they're making that long, winding climb. You said, Tom, was it 10 stories of elevation you gained? That's the whole story here at Mosport. You're not just going up a straight where you're flat out all the time. You're actually climbing up over 100 feet of vertical. And look at the very unique line as the white flag comes out. We're starting this last lap out of turn 10 normally you're just way outside sweeping around as you said though you want to be away from where the rubber is in the wet but that they really square that exit up don't they yeah you know and they're finding the grip where it is to be had and Kleinubing is right there as they see their white flag together you've got to feel bad about the fact of having Pierre Kleinubing on your bumper with one lap to go just some incredible racing and I think it's fairly impressive as we saw that white flag come out that uh, even though Kuno was able to get around Grohovic, he's not just leaving him. Toby Grohovic still driving a very solid race, albeit down a lap. Well, you know, he is down a lap, but now the conditions are drying and all these real-time guys coming together on the racetrack. You see the depth and the strength of this team. Let's hop on board with Nick Whitmer as he's making his way down through turn four, heading up into Moss. Oh! Big, lurid slide. Let's see, who could have done that? Hey, hey. Oh, there he goes. So, contact, we do and this all on replay. If we'd have done it real time, you'd have missed it. But they contact at the top of the hill, and uh, that contact causes them both nearly to spin, and this is the result of the back straight, Greg. Well, Pierre is not one to ever go quietly and accept a position. Kuno Whitmer gets the win. This will drive this place nuts as the Canadian brings it home here at Mosport for the win. And here at the line, Kleinubing is able to sweep through, pick up second with Nick Whitmer third. So the Whitmer brothers, one and three on the podium. An incredible run, Jason Saney just missing out in fourth. And for Kuno Whitmer, no race means more than one on home soil, and he's done it. Let's get to victory, sir. When you're 21 seconds ahead of everybody else, does it get lonely out there? No, because the whole field, I mean, we're talking all talented drivers that each one of us can win a race. So, you know, fortunately, real-time Acura, 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 Acura. We have the best cars out here. So 
the hat, my hat goes out to them. And you know, being down on home soil, yeah, I, I can't even express myself right now. Well, I got my family up there. They're all the way up there. They're waving, and that's it's for them, the fans, you know, the sponsors, the papers. That's why I want to win here. And he did, and it was a great performance. Here are the unofficial final results. And you can see Whitmer, Kleinubing, Whitmer. What a great day for real-time racing. Take a look at the points, and as you can see, very, very tight. Our next show, back here at Mo Sports, another round of touring cars, joined by the GT machines. It is going to be awesome. Forecast is for sunny and dry. Don't miss it. We'll see you then.